fans and welcome back to the Demon Land Podcast. My name is Andy. And well, if your heart didn't stop in the dying moments of that match, well, then you probably don't have a heart. Personally, Carlton fans have made my footy childhood a living nightmare, so there was truly no better way to defeat them than in the manner that we did. And hopefully that victory helps knock them out of finals contention. Joining me tonight to discuss that heart-stopping victory over the Blues is veteran Demonlander George. Good evening, George. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, Ben Man. And good evening to all our listeners, especially Nairobi Demon over there in Africa, I assume, who posed the question for us this week. We were 12 seconds from a, in a, in a different, in a parallel universe, we were 12 seconds from a very different feeling in the Demon Land community this week. So let's find how, let's find out exactly how we do feel. Well, it, it would have been interesting, don't you think? Uh, this podcast would would have a whole different feel to it, you would think, if we had uh, lost that game uh, rather than win. Um, I certainly, yeah. uh, I said in the, the the podcast thread earlier that I've got, I had a massive headache before. This no, I probably would have pulled out of this uh, podcast because uh, yeah, it would have been a much more depressing feel to it. Um, I will ask our guests how he would feel, our other uh, host, uh, who's also joining us uh, to discuss the nail-biter bin man. Good evening, bin man. Good evening, Dean Landers, Andy and George, and I just got demoted there for a sec, suddenly yeah, uh, yeah, back a, to a guest. You're I've, just a guest. I've slipped down the slippery slope now. I, I've just got to, um, for the listeners out there, I did promise that I'd run around naked around the G if uh, Harmsey wasn't selected. Um, now he wasn't, and I couldn't organise to do that run along the um, to the boundary line at quarter or three-quarter time. They wouldn't let me do it. So um, I'm naked now as um, as Andy. Oh, well, that's not true, actually. I'm wearing a beanie, uh, as Andy <laughs> and George can attest. So, that's um, a dis- disappointment, Bin Man. I thought you were that streaker at, uh, was it quarter time? It, it was, was three-quarter time. Pretty weak <laughs> streaker. He didn't have much... It was wearing a few layers of clothes. It was an amazing, amazing victory. And I said last week, you know, isn't it crazy? I literally did not look at any football media after the Pies game right up until the bounce. I was listening to the music two, 10 seconds before the bounce and turned that off. Um, you know, for one of a different kick, uh, you know, a kick in it last week, it would have been a completely different week. And exactly the same is true this week. It was just it was a fantastic experience. One of the best games I can ever recall. One of the best endings to a game. Let's not let's not <laughs> gild the lily on the actual game. But um, you know, I've had some thrilling um, uh, victories at the MCG, but few more than that. Um, it was just phenomenal, and and nothing beats it. Does it go to the footy? A lot riding on it. A win like that, and it's just grown men and and women going bananas. Just loved it. Um, just going back to your uh, comment about harms, uh, Luann C on uh, from our Facebook uh, page, uh, Demonland Facebook page, which you can find at facebook.com slash Demonland31. Uh, she wrote a message in and she said, mm, harms isn't back in the lineup. Doesn't Big Man have to run around the MCG naked? And you've heard why he didn't. But she also asked, so I said, I'd remind it you. It was very cold as well. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I did remind, I said, I'll, I'll remind him and make sure he does. And she says, time and dates would be great. So um, you, have a, you have a fan there, uh, Luann. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> clearly it's page. my avatar on Demon Land. <laughs> <laughs> you could still run around the MCG naked uh, bin man. You don't have to go on the inside. That's true, and I didn't specify when and where, did I? <laughs> so, okay. no, so, in fact, actually, I've scratched all of that. I've already done it. I did it at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning. <laughs> what do they say? Picks or it didn't happen. Uh, Luann, we'll, we'll get back <laughs> yeah. to you uh, on that one. Um, well, let's go into our match wrap up. I'll make a quick. Um, uh, the first quarter was a bit of a slog and wasn't in uh, the most attractive of contests. The Blues uh, looked like they went into it with a game plan and strategy to defeat us. And George, I think you worked it out. Uh, um, it, and and there, the, you worked out by saying that they went on in on in our um, in your match review, uh, saying they played man on man, denying the demon space, you know, applying pressure so that even if the contest, or uh, even if one contest was won by us, the next contest uh, would would be hotly contested as well on that man on man situation. Um, and the Blues game plan might have worked if they hadn't abandoned that game plan in the dying minutes of the game uh, when it counted. Uh, the rest of the match was uh, not much different. 
different with both teams going goal for goal. And despite uh, the D's leading for the majority of the match, uh, we were unable to extend that lead at any time. And I, I always thought that we'd just at one stage be able to break away, but that just it just never happened. Uh, week after week after week, we we're keeping opposition teams in the contest as a result of our lack of firepower up forward, and once again, our inaccuracy in front of the sticks almost cost us another match. The lack of tall targets in our forward line continues to be a massive issue. Uh, ben Brown has absolutely no support in marking contests, and he's expected to fill both the role of a full forward and a centre half forward. His form at the moment isn't great. He's continually misreading the flight of the ball and running under it and attempting sometimes to mark it even with one hand. And in any event, it wasn't a good sign that the Ds didn't even start Big Benny on the field and they elected to use Max as our tour target up forward. I can't see this makeshift forward line bearing fruit in September as it's simply not being fertilised properly now. 58 forward 50 entries with for 24 scoring shots and only 11 goals. The Blues had 10 less entries for the same amount of scoring shots. But all hail Jake Melksham. He really stood up this week. We haven't seen this Jake Melksham in a long time. He was uh, marking whilst lying on the floor on his back. He was out marking three tall defenders. He ended up with four goals and it probably should have been a five or six goal haul as he missed some very gettable shots. And Cozzy, how can we not mention the match winner? What a goal. If the Premiership medal didn't seal him in the Hall of Fame, then this goal that broke the hearts of every single Carlton fan that I've ever known uh, gets you in my Hall of Fame, Cozzy. Um once again, our defenders were commendable. Uh, Petty kept the Coleman leader to one goal late in the game and May and Mackay probably broke even despite some dubious freeze to the latter and the non-freeze, well, not received uh, to the former. Um, shout out to Jaden Hunt, who I thought played a superb game, particularly in the late stages of the match. He has certainly learned the art of lowering the eyes and hitting up a target. Uh, he's run and dash off the halfback is what we've lacked and he's bringing that at the moment. And on the latest stages of that game, I'll make this clear, we should not have won that game. The Blues did everything that I would hope that we wouldn't do in a similar circumstance. And once Kerno received the ball on our half forward line with a minute 20 left on the clock, they should not have lost. In fact, uh, they probably should not have even given up possession at that stage. But give it up, they did, and Jake Lever was smart enough to go into the middle rather than down, uh, predictably down the line. And Jaden Hunt with his dash kick, he kicks it high to the top of the square. Um, ben Brown brings the ball to ground. The incredible milk dishes it out to Cozzy, and 40 years of my childhood trauma is almost wiped out in an instant. So uh, take that to the appeals board, uh, Blues fans. Uh, it wasn't the prettiest of wins. I could only count a few of those type of wins in my lifetime. Round 23 last year and perhaps the win in Adelaide when Leon Shelley kicked the goal at Footy Park. Uh, we're usually on the receiving end of those type of, uh, l well, losses, I guess. Uh, gentlemen, uh, any comments and thoughts on this match before we get stuck into our listener questions? B-Man? Oh, George, go. Oh, by all means. I'll, I'll start. Yeah, it was, for me, it, I was watching the game and it took me ages to work out what in the hell was going on because it was it was like watching a game from 10 years ago. Um, they, they, I eventually worked out they were playing man on man all over the ground and um, I was looking and constantly looking for where are the extras, where is the, man, the extras in defence that we see so much of these days, where's the extras around the ball and it, it just wasn't there. <clears throat> um, the result was but an awful display to, from the spectators to watch um, because it was just contest, contest after contest after contest. Everything was under pressure. Um, people might have noticed there were no switches from either side during the game because if you were looking to switch, there was no one to switch to uh, because they were running with our players, our players were running with them. Um, it just nullified everything around the ground. Now, I don't know whether uh, Michael Voss is using the same tactics as when he played or whether he's a brilliant tactician, but it certainly worked for them for 98 out of the 100 minutes in the game. Um, and as Andy has said, when the, when they stopped doing that in the last two minutes, so when they pushed the extras into the back line, into the ball, um, it left. You know, and if you look at the vision on the uh, Melbourne Footy Club side of the last two or three minutes, you'll see four spare Melbourne players in the middle of the ground so when, when for example, <clears throat> um, Max took that intercept mark, it was because he wasn't in the forward line. You know? uh, Silvani had moved forward instead, instead of sitting alongside Max. Then we saw Mackay and Kerno and, and Saad 
uh, either kicked the ball or punched the ball forward. And guess what? <laughs> Went the same Melbourne players picked it up and and delivered it straight back into the forward line. So it was an incredibly silly either errors by their players or their coaching staff. But hey, who cares? We won <laughs> we won the game. They didn't. Um, they they can do that again. But um, the um, when you look back at the end of the game, it, it was interesting because there were some fantastic matchups. You know that uh, the McKay versus um, uh, May won the. Um, Kerno versus Petty in particular was just fantastic. You know, Petty kept him goalless. The, this is the Coleman medal, Coleman medalist leader at the moment, goalless until that last three minutes or two minutes. Um, there were contests all around the ground which were just fantastic individually, but unfortunately as a display it wasn't great, except for the Melbourne supporters in that last three minutes. So we'll take that one away. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting game. I mean, it was a... To be there was was such a different experience to watching on telly. I mean, as I'm saying, it's everything that's great about going to the to the a game of footy. Um, you know, in terms of the end, it, um, but you're right. That's a really good way of describing it, George. It was like an old school game of footy with just contest after contest. Um, I mean, it wasn't a great game to watch when you were there, and it was full of errors. As you say, the skills were poor, lots of mistakes on on either side. The first half was painful to watch. It opened up a little bit in the second half. Um, but on the skills, I was thinking during the game that it looked a perfect night for the footy, uh, for footy and it would have on the telly. Um, and, and the ground looked in good nick, but it hammered down earlier um, in the afternoon, I think before the women's game uh, at the G. Um, and so given how cold it was, the ground was still pretty slippery probably and it wouldn't have drained much. There still would have been some a fair bit of moisture in that grass. So um, that would have explained quite a few of the slipperiness and, the, and the, you know we missed a lot of handballs by targets. Um, and also those really cold nights at the G often seem to lead to scrappy games for some reason. The sort of the atmosphere is heavy in terms of the dew and the, um, it was pretty bloody cold. Um, but it was funny because I, I watched that game and, you know, it was a pretty unpleasant experience for the first half. Um, but I went home and, uh, unlike last week, um, lapped up all of the media I could, including watching the replay when I got home from the footy. And I had a completely different take on the quality of the game after that. And, um, you know, I was feeling like, I think on reflection, that my response watching live was filtered through a lens of feeling sick about losing the game, about the thought of losing the game, the implications of lo- losing the game, um, and that feeling that we weren't, we were simply not as good as I thought we were. And, um, you know, th- that thinking was impacted by thoughts such as Chira, uh, Chera being a laid out, hit by the um, Karma bus, Hewitt and Kennedy also out and thinking, well, you know, we still can't go on top of their midfield, who I thought they were they're terrific. Their contest work was great. Um, and I think I um, did what Goody warns against pretty much every second presser um, that he does is I underestimated our opponent. I thought they played... One, I thought they played better than I thought they were going to in coming into the match, but particularly after Chera was out. But two, more curiously, I thought they played heaps better on the replay than I realised watching live uh, on the telly. They, they were brilliant in the contest. They were fantastic in their clinches. Their pressure intensity was um, was totally finals like that. The, absolutely, they brought the pressure. They played like a team playing for a spot in the, final, in the finals, and and they were. Um, I thought Voss was really clever. Their structure were, was clever. They had set a field on Lang- Langders, Langdon that really took him out of the play. I thought, um, you know, uh, even Silvani into the ruck was really effect- effective. Pitane is an underrated ruckman, but they did a great job um, negating Maxi's influence, I thought. Um, and they worked super hard in the contest. Like they were a, cl- a clearance team and they um, and they worked super hard to do that. But, you know, all of that meant, as you're saying, George, is it was a Dow defensive arm wrestle, like an old school 90s game of footy that's, you know, at the MCG on a cold, cold, wet night. Um, but that was as much about how um, Cozzy, uh, sorry, as much as um, how Carlton looked to set the game up as opposed to us being um, particularly Dow. The other thing I didn't really recognise um, live at the game was how hard they swamped back and clagged, deliberately clagged up our um, forward line and put players behind the ball defensively. They worked super hard. Um, on that last play, though, just to say, Andy, I reckon there's been... 
you know, one of, I listened to the um, Cozzy being interviewed on the way home on the radio and Melksham um, on the way, and both said that they specifically train during the week um, on that scenario, on being behind scenario, on the back of um, the disappointing last two minutes against the Pies. Um, and there's no question in my mind that they set that up. Um, Lever didn't even look. He let, went laterally inboard Um kicking around his body, um, no doubt that wasn't at, – at the ground I thought, what great bit of vision. You know, that was fantastic bit of work. But when I saw some footage that was on the, um, I think, um, first crack or another one, you can see Lever prior to that contest pointing towards the corridor to get players in there. And the fact that they had three players in the corridor and everyone else was down the line because Carlton – it was clever because Carlton were protecting the down the line. We go there 99.9% of the time. <laughs> um, we had three players um, by themselves. To be honest, we were really lucky because the ball just bounced over, you know, wicked bounce over the top of that fella's head. Yeah, but it was, it was the first good, first good bounce we've had in, in months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was good coaching, great execution by the players, and I'm sure that was part of their how thrilled Goody was afterwards because they clearly had practiced that. And Cozzy was fantastic on this interview on SEN. He was saying that I loved it that if you watch this is quote unquote if you watch the down the ground vision, you will see the because he was asked how you know you kept so calm, and he said, well, all the forwards were calm. We knew what our role was, um, and we were focused on executing it. And if you look at down the ground vision, you'll see us pointing to where we should be and and talking about what we needed to do, which I thought was a fantastic insight into their week's preparation for the game and the mindset. So I thought it was a much more impressive victory than I felt at the, the game, um, both because I thought Carlton played well and it was awesome to get the uh, the win. Just fantastic to get the win. I went bananas after <laughs> after Cozzy kicked that goal. It was interesting, wasn't it, Ben? I mean, I... Collingwood didn't give us the opportunities that Carlton gave us in this game, you know, in that last two minutes that, uh, you know, the classic one was Saad who punched the ball forward. Now, if that was... I don't think it was Saad, it was another player, but the one not hitting Saad was the thing. That guy missing that for 15 minutes and forcing Saad to kick a high dump kick down the line. No, uh, no, it wasn't the kick. It wasn't the kick. It was when he punched the ball forward. No, it wasn't. I'm pretty sure it was was, Saad. Yeah, but punching the ball forward, Collingwood would have... Grabbed the ball, taken it to the ground, caught us another, totally. another um, ball up, and the game would have been over. But uh, Mackay and and Kerno both kicked the kicked the ball forward again. The same thing. Collingwood would yep. have been looking to kick the ball backwards. You know, to, yeah, exactly. To totally, player. they were. Yeah, they, were, they got rattled. I mean, yep. young team. Well, not that young, I guess. But yeah. the other, the other final thing about the last two minutes is I almost had a conniption when um, um, Maxi smashed it into space because he did that. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before in a tight game where we lost because he he hit it um, into the defensive space to a free player. Um, he did it again in this game, and they had an op- opportunity to get an inside 50. He just skied the ball. Well, let's get into our um, into our listeners' questions and comments. We've got quite a few. Um, before I do that, if you would like to join us uh, on the show tonight, you can give us a call on 03 That's 03 Or you can Skype us at Demonland. Thirty-one, um, and, and just just a note, Andy, in the uh, chat room, uh, Terence has offered yep. to uh, start a legal fund via <laughs> crowdfunding to cover uh, Bin Man's arrest and hearing. <laughs> so there you go, there you go, Bin Man. You can uh, you can strip naked and run around the G. We'll uh, we'll, well, we'll, che- we'll I che- do that most weekends anyway. <laughs> but it's like <laughs> we'll check in with with you uh, in about half an hour. Um, <laughs> our um, our first question tonight is from. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, th- this is a question from Bin Man, uh, and you know Bin Man, your hosts can't actually ask questions, but Bin Man asks: uh, Harry Petty does a brilliant job one on one against Kerno to spoil and not infringe, only just hitting Kerno's outstretched arms, as happens in fifty aerial contests in a match. Yet the umpires pay a free. Okay, that's the benchmark for a marking infringement. Brown and Gorn get scragged and their arms held and or smashed at every aerial contest they're engaged in and yet barely receive a single free between them. What's up with that? Asking for a friend. Um, I have to agree with you uh, there, Ben Man. Um, ben Brown gets absolutely um, chopped and and infringed upon and uh, everything. 
I often notice that the, the we we get a lot of free kicks against our defenders, particularly in the last couple of weeks. But our forwards are never afforded the same uh, thing. But uh, I'm not going to cry. And there's about been it. a lot of talk about t- about kicking to the same spot and kicking down the line and having our big boys going up for the mark, uh, and about how potentially oppositions have worked that out, quote unquote. Um, but what? is happening a lot in those contests. You watch that, how often they scrag. They are so focused on just stopping Gorn marking the footy. It just drives me nuts. Like, you know, and he's, if you, Gorn works really hard not to get frustrated, um, but he can't help himself sometimes. And I don't know what they, you know, what do you do about it? But it's just, it's just ridiculous. That one against Kerno, he, he barely touched him. I thought Petty did a brilliant job not mm. to give that free kick away. And then you have like Mackay pushing, uh, uh, May square May in, in the, the back, back with his hands yeah. pushed him in the back, no free. But having, uh, having said that, we got a not a bad run with the umpires. And, no, we uh, did. There were a lot of complaints from Carlton. Fans, good, so that good. was good. To, I'm happy. Good. To I'm hear. happy there. <laughs> I'm happy there. Unhappy. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Zephyr, um wants to know uh, as a club, were we happy with the last two home attendances? And George, you wanted to take this, uh, but uh, we had fifty five thousand seven hundred and five this week. We had almost seventy one thousand last week, and I'd say. They'd be pretty happy with that. I, however, was a little bit dis- disappointed with the turnout in my particular section. It's it's all reserved seats where I sit, and yet there are a lot of empty seats and many familiar faces uh, that weren't there. And I reckon that's pretty poor. We could probably could have had more than the fifty five thousand. But uh, George, yeah, I think uh, the club would be happy with those with those results. Um, uh, given what's happened over the last couple of years with COVID in particular, mm-hmm. we're getting back to where we used to be. So that's, that's pleasing. Um, <clears throat> from the club's financial perspective, it was these, these last two games have been a great fill up to them because this year we had uh, no Queen's birthday game and no Anzac Eve game. Um, they were all the way games. Uh, and the real concern is with um, those are our two blockbuster games of the year. Um, Financially, the, that would have been a really big hit to us, you know, probably in the order of one to two million dollars worth. So to get these two extra games um, with these big crowds has um, ameliorated that. And next year we've got the Queen's birthday and the Anzac Eve, Eve games, so that's a, a double bonus for us. So um, yeah, I think I think internally they'd be pretty pleased with that. We'd always like to see more people turn up to the game. Um, but given what's happened, like I said, for the last couple of years, it's, it's not surprising. Um, the big the big games are always between the big member-based clubs, except for Hawthorne. Um, so um, it's not surprising, Collingwood and Carlton. And we also picked up 44,000 uh, in the Essendon game earlier in the year when they were full of hope and aspiration, <laughs> but that doesn't exist anymore, particularly as of today. Um. El Diablo has two questions. Uh, the first, uh, uh, what are Big Man's thoughts on the Premiership Metrics topic posted by Demonland Poster Wheelow Ratings? Uh, um, Big Man, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this thread. Uh, do you want to just explain what El Diablo is referring to in regards to Premiership Metrics uh, that the Demonland member Wheelow posted? I believe they're his metrics as well, I think. Yeah, I, I actually look. To be honest, I haven't had time to to go through the post, so um, so um, yeah, I can't really well, sort of respond to that. We one. might so, we might table that for for next week uh, if there is that uh, pre season buy. And George, you'll um, put your hand up. But uh, yeah, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, the only thing I think you've got to be careful about when you put these sort of tables together is that. Uh, you're not using statistics to look for an outcome. Rather, the outcome should be producing the statistics. Um, one of the things that did strike me immediately was there were no statistics quoted for scoring inside 50s. Um, so I would think that we, for example, would be well and truly down on that this year in particular. So that that, But all the others seem, seem in a good manner. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you fully expect a team that's second or third on the ladder to score more than the opposition during the year. So you've got to be very careful about what you're showing. Every, every premiership side would have been you know, in that sort of bracket as a general rule. Probably the dogs being the exception a couple of years ago from where they finished up. But look, it's showing that a lot of our metrics are very similar to previous years and, and previous premiership uh, winners. So it's not surprising, though, when you consider where we're sitting on the ladder at this time uh, of the year. 
And maybe, Andy, we will go into a bit more detail, but essentially um, the, um, Wheeler Ratings uh, analysis is the, from the last 10 premiership teams, what do they have in common? They're all ranked in the top six in the following statistical categories in their premiership year. Shot at goal differential um, or ranked top four, total points conceded, opposition shots at goal, opposition goals, percentage and inside 50s. Um, and... I saw this post that I wanted to go through the um, because it's got quite a detailed table and I wanted to go through it and give it some time to look at it. So maybe we can look at it next week. It's interesting, though, with stats and the way, you know, I think it's a good, interesting point, um, George, you make, because for me it's sometimes not in this example, but stats are used often on Fox footy and um, on Channel 7 as an explanation, uh, you know, is that that's the cause almost. And I often feel like there's a, a confusion between symptom and cause. And, and what's, you know, what I look for for stats is to, to I have an hypothesis and then I'll go look for the stats to see whether there's evidence for that. And so as an example of it, this this issue, and it came up, someone posted on Twitter, Andy, and we'll get, maybe we'll talk about this next week after the season's done and dusted because we'll have a full season of data. But pr- this concept of pressure gets thrown around all the time. You see it on Demon Land, you see it on the couch, and that Melbourne are 18th in pressure this year as if, if that's the actual answer. Uh, and now I'm not saying that that's not an issue that we were number one last year uh, on this measure, but I'm pretty sure most people are throwing that around, aren't understanding which metric is being talked about. But two, my question would be, well, why? What, what do, What's that telling us? There's been some discussion about we're setting our zone deeper that might impact on that. I'm not saying it's not an issue. It's just in of itself, it doesn't tell us enough to be able to, to definitively say, well, if you fix the pressure, everything will, will be fine. So I, I just think that that's a bit of a trap with with um, stats, not in, not in this case, and that's a brilliant analysis. I just um, really didn't have time to go in, to drill down on it properly. So um, it would be good to do so for next week, I think. Yeah, well, hopefully, I'm not sure what the whether there's a, a pre-finals buy. Uh, I don't think anyone really knows what's happening next week. Um, but if there is, then we'll likely do a, a finals preview and go into s- metrics such as that and talk about our, our year to date. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, El Diablo also asks, who would you consider a certainty to make the All-Australian team? Um, for me at the moment, I, I reckon uh, Clary, Track, May, Gorn, and perhaps Brayshaw. Brayshaw might get into the squad, um, but might, they might not get into the, the main team. But I think he's been superb in defence. I'd love him to get a nod, but I'm not sure whether uh, the AFL will go there <laughs> or whoever's uh, choosing the team. What do you guys think, George? Uh, all Australians from the Ds? George, you're, you're muted. Uh, you just unmute yourself. Sorry, I, th- I think that's a pretty good good summation uh, of that. I think the only, particularly for the squad as opposed to the team, uh, the only other possible I thought would be Cozzy as the small forward. Um, he's got a fair bit of competition from people like Rayner and Cameron. Um, sorry, Cameron in particular uh, at Brisbane. Uh, but yeah, that, that's pretty close to the mark, I think. It's interesting, isn't it, that there's probably Lever won't be in it this year. It goes to... You know, I think the the All Australian probably tells a tale in terms of we just haven't had the same run we did last year with you know luck. Although you know, having said that, we're in a great spot um, injury wise now. We've got Tommy Max really our only um, uh, key injury at the moment. So um, you know, the the things are aligning a bit better now. But um, definitely at that top end, we won't have as many as we did last year. And certainly our, our representatives last year, like Gorn May. Lever um, have all had have all had extended periods um, away for injury reasons mm. during the year. So um, yeah, they, they tend to drop off a little bit uh, in terms of their output as a result. Uh, interesting, and because we talked about Brayshaw being a chance, does him coming into the midfield in the last handful of games mean that he's no longer eligible for an All Australian spot in the back line, which would be ironic given basically they pick midfielders and squeeze them into the wing or our uh, forward flank or, you know, if they want him in, they get him in. Well, in that um, case... Not, that doesn't seem to happen for defenders. In that case, he will get in and as a defender, but... <laughs> Fair, we'll see. Because yeah. of that. But I, I think even though he's played the last two weeks or whatever in the midfield, I think his work as a defender this year... Um, 
at least gets him into the squad and hopefully gets him into the team. But uh, we shall see. And he is playing that role as like a defensive mid, the way he sets yeah. up at contests. And it's interesting actually watching him. He, he was terrific, wasn't yeah. he? He was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, D Old Fart uh, says several media pundits, as well as some Demon Landers, are posturing correctly, in my view, that we are currently playing conservative football without the match winning flair and dare that proved so successful in the recent past. What do the panel think about this aspect of our play? And in particular, what is the reason for it? Is it structural, personnel, form? Is it a tactical decision on our part? And if so, why? Is it being forced upon us by opposition tactics? Is it an approach we can readily revive now that we are at the pointy end of the season? Uh, B-Man, what do you think? And then, George, you can jump in with your thoughts. Uh, look, it's really interesting, actually. I, I mean, we people are saying that, but then forgetting the um, first half against Collingwood. We could not have been more aggressive in our um, approach in that game, um, you know, you could argue that um, Collingwood facilitated that by going fast, but as I said in last week's show, we drove that. Um, you know, so there there is some outliers to that, and the same is true of the Doggies game, which, which wasn't very well, um, long ago. Um, but for me, what I would say is that we're not yet at our physical peak. And so, look, you know, obviously I've been talking about loading. The principle is to um, be peaking for, you know, coming into finals and maintaining that through to prelim and peaking on prelim prelim day, but being at pretty close to optimal physical readiness um, um, in fi- come finals or even this weekend. Um, I went back again. I watched the Adelaide game. We weren't that impressive in that game they got they came back at us we were 40 odd points back and they got within two goals in the third quarter and the the margin was really flattered we won by 41 points but we kicked three goals in the last 90 seconds of that game so that you know that wasn't a super impressive victory um and so my answer to that question is that it's a real pro it's a real challenge with our the way our game plan because goody stubborn or you want to call him stubborn or committed or he has a particular philosophy his game plan won't change it's the same with his discussion about they're still playing for like they've got a second forward um but the the problem is assessing our game plan at the moment is it's built for optimal fitness come finals it's not built for now um sure he could take a different approach and look to mitigate against that but he chooses not to it's pretty clear so the the challenge is you know um, I'm I'm confident that um, we will be f- um, fresher this week and then fresher again come finals. Maybe we will miss the top four because of that strategy and that so that opens up a whole different dialogue. Um, my point being is that our game plan um, needs us to be fully fresh and being able to run out the full game because we clearly didn't against Carlton, we clearly didn't against the Pies, both of those teams which are probably right at their p- physical peak right now. Um, uh, ran out both games better. Um, and what we couldn't do in both matches, which was really evident, we couldn't generate overlap and run. That's how you get fast scoring. You create overlap and run and switch and have your that wave running that we saw in the finals last year. That's what the model is. That's what the game plan is. So it's a bit like running a Formula One car on normal leaded fuel. Um, it's going to not look great. It's not going to um, um, make the times it normally does. Put some decent fuel in there um, and we'll start seeing um, the game plan click into gear. Um, you know, that's the big, the evident thing that pointing around, I'm hearing it everywhere, is we've got stodgy, we're not playing how we were. That's because we're not able to run in waves. We don't have the three, four players that are running to take that handball and players running ahead of the ball that creates space forward of the ball. Um, and it suddenly looks like, well, Melbourne have got two extra players on the ground. That hasn't happened yet because the comparative fitness advantage hasn't been there yet. Um, I'm hoping like hell that it will be, uh, and I'm really confident that it will be. Um, But keeping in mind in this game too, the other factor for context for parallels to last season um, was that these two games that we've just played, everyone agrees, anyone who went to either game, they were finals-like intensity. None of the the games we played last year were finals-like intensity, not even against Geelong. That was in an empty stadium. Um, But speaking of parallels to last season, I think it's, you know, it's worth thinking if if you're on board with the old idea of us peaking um, as we approach finals, is that we ran out that game much better than Geelong last year. We came from 41 points down with eight minutes in the third quarter and smashed Geelong for the rest of that game. They could barely touch the ball. Um, so 
I'm hoping that, you know, it's an incredibly similar game in terms of how this one sets up. We're playing for a top two position. Um, we're playing another contender. We're playing them at their home deck um, at a really hard game um, ground to play against. So there's lots of um, parallels and, um, you know, I'll, I'll be really looking to see us uh, run out the game. I'm really hoping that we, we really, we're close to our peak fitness and we'll be able to tell how we're going in that last quarter. One difference is that they've got a hostile crowd, but uh, <laughs> this yeah, time. that's a big difference. Yeah, uh, yeah. George. Just, just one more, one more thing to add to what Bin Man's just said is that um, uh, the flair and dare sort of game has huge risks associated with it. If you want to, if you if you watch the Sydney um, Collingwood game, Collingwood were playing a spectacular brand of football, particularly in the last quarter, and they got smashed. And, th- and that's the danger with playing that sort of game. At the moment, we're playing to win games. It's, and it's a completely different focus. When when we get to the to the, the right stages, then you can adopt that sort of um, game plan. But uh, not just not not at the moment, <laughs> especially when you've got tight games. You can't afford to lose the ball in the middle of the ground. It'll just go straight back over your head, and you'll be further further behind on the scoreboard. Um. The next two questions from listeners sort of relate to each other, so I'll read them both and then get your thoughts on the matter. And I know B-Man has gotten into a few arguments on Demon Land in regards to this. So here they are. Uh, Kong Wacker says, I was at the game and thought a number of our players were not moving freely. Question for the panel, do you also see that? I understand the football department adopted the Burgess mantra last year and have continued this year. Uh, that's the mantra of resilience. Uh, don't necessarily nurse slash rest injuries and niggles, rather continue to train and play through them. I also understand these injuries and niggles are monitored by experienced professionals, but I'm wondering maybe the cumulative effects across the team are starting to impact players such as Gorn, Track, Cozzy, Lever, Salem, Brayshaw, to name a few. Uh, your thoughts on this, please. Uh, and before, I think, George, you want to take this, but before that, I'll just, uh, Kelpian adds, Cozzy's knee was heavily strapped this week and he appeared to be limping most of the match and didn't have the usual zip that he has. Is he injured? Thankfully, we played him, but should we be players that are clearly injured? So, uh, George, you want to take this first? Yeah, there's a couple of things here. Um, hopefully, um, uh, shout out to Kong Wacker. Hopefully, hopefully you do come from Kong Wack in the uh, in Gippsland, somewhere between <laughs> uh, Wan Thaggy and and Karen Burrow, if I remember. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't that out, uh, Annie. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't understand that reference. I was hoping it wasn't something uh, X-rated. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, Don't Google it. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, to to Kong Wacker. Um, Look, every, every team has injured players playing at the moment. Every side has the same sort of thing. It's just a question of, of the extent of the injuries and, and the assessment about whether they're capable of getting up. Um, uh, our team here of Bin Man and Andy and I uh, went to uh, a training session last Friday and it was very obvious that uh, Cosy was struggling. Uh, he had a heavy bandage that you saw on the weekend. Uh, he was limping, limping uh, during that session. Ben Brown did even less um, during during the session, and it's been admitted by by Goody himself that he has to be managed. Um, and Jordan that, was limping at the training on, on yep. Friday, and yeah. Jordan's Another, knee, knee was strapped during the game. Again, yeah. yeah. Um, in this in in this game, um, Lever certainly had something. He, he had a bandage around his head, I think, at one stage. Um, the fact that he dropped down, he only had four intercepts for the game, which is just unlever like for, um, for the, from that. Uh, Langdon was well down from where he was. Um, you remember, yeah, no, he, he was blanketed by Satterfield, so. yeah, uh, or or Cottrell, was it? Um, Cottrell, was it? Yeah. Satterfield was um, on, um, uh, Clary was tagging yeah. him. Ah, oh, right, of yeah. course, so yeah, yeah, but it certainly wasn't the same sort of outputs that we get normally from uh, track, obviously, wasn't wasn't completely fit, um, particularly in that last quarter. The interesting one for me was Jackson, um, who only played 60, 64% game time. That's a long time off the ground in a 100-minute game uh, when one-third of it's uh, spent off the, off the ground. Um, so, yeah, we've got, a lot, we've got a lot of people carrying injuries. It's not surprising. Um, the other problem that we've got is uh, who do you replace these people with? Um, uh, who do you who do you bring? You've got a Tomlinson probably to hold someone down in the back line. We know that we haven't got any available forwards available uh, to us. You can certainly never replace a Cozzy. Um, 
what do you do? We haven't we haven't got a ruck to replace a Jackson. Uh, what do but you do? I mean, I think it's a really interesting question because people said this last year. I mean, I remember when we were going to Port, I was saying, got to rest Max. He's, you know, that's the time to do it. Um, then it came out post-season, this philosophy about resilience. And, I mean, like, uh, how do you judge it? So you judge it on the metrics that you can judge it on. George, you're 100% right. Is every AFL football team is carrying players with injuries that are undisclosed or, you know, you talk to any fan, they'll, they'll, they'll be able to pick four or five of their players at any given time who are carrying something. Now, traditional thing is you rest them for general soreness. That's what Geelong does. Um, you know, Burgess had a particular philosophy and, and let's be frank here, the score's on the board. We won a premiership last year so you know with that philosophy in mind um two things is that i read on demon land and and uh, forget who posted it so apologies for that but um pointed out that when um, burgess was at arsenal he changed his philosophy there he had a re- he used to rest players but he changed his philosophy when he got um an assistant to go through decades of um, data uh, and around arresting players um, at the elite level and came to the conclusion that um, that there was no correlation between resting players and preventing soft tissue injuries. One of the most remarkable things about Burgess um, in his two years at Melbourne was how few soft, injury, soft tissue injuries we've had. How many have we had this year? Um, Rosman's out. I think he's had two. We've probably had maybe max three or four soft tissue tissue injuries you compare what's now happening at Collingwood who as I said are probably right at their very peak and pushing it Ginevan does his hammy um uh Dugowie and the Gora- um is out with some sort of strain and then someone else with an uh, adductor strain um similar sorry uh, similar with Carlton who chair has got an adductor strain and um you know so and I've just read before Jeremy Cameron's out with a soft tissue injury um that's three weeks right on the on the um eve of finals the proof's in the pudding. Now, talk about Cozzy being injured. I mean, he doesn't play. There's, we don't win that game. I mean, that's as simple as that. I mean, it was remarkable. And so that resilience thing, you could say, sure, you know, you should rest him. Maybe there's fresher players to bring in. But what does the team collectively get out of the fact that Cozzy pushed through that? I mean, as George said, he was noticeably limping. He was even limping in the warm-up in this game. Yet he win- kicks a match-winning goal. What does that – you've got to factor that into the equation about whether, you know, players should be rested. But the bottom line is, you know, we're paying these guys a lot of money um, and women in the sports science team to be the experts on it. So, you know, if that's their philosophy, they've got credit in the bank um, and, you know, they're the pros. So um, all power to them. And, you know, it seems to be working. I mean, the proof's in the pudding. Radelaide says... Big Benny Brown was either constantly running under the ball in marking contests or was using the one hand to take to attempt to take a mark. Uh, was he misreading the ball coming in and is he using one hand in an attempt to bring the ball uh, to the ground? What's going on with Brown? Anyone want to know? <laughs> is it, I'll it, tell you that in terms of I reckon Brownie had a great first half and, I mean, it's a, it, they worked him – to like a horse, like, you know, a draft horse. He was up and down the ground. He was in defence. He ran himself into the ground and he does seem to be sort of misreading it a bit, but he's always done that. He's, that's not a new new thing. I mean, Jackson does it too. I mean, I, that's the number of times Jackson runs under the ball. He's like a basketball centre. He jumps straight up often. So um, it's not helped the amount of smashing he gets. And I think we've talked about this, the big, one of the big, um, problems with not having T-Mac there is how well T-Mac blocks for Brown. So I think that's a big yeah. factor. Um, it was, you know, I take that point around, you know, his form, but I think it also should be credit where it's due. That was a fantastic mark late in that quarter. And for a team that struggles to kick goals, for him to so calmly go onto his right foot and turn that around the corner and kick it, you know, where that was another match winning element of that last quarter so you know I, I thought his work rate was fantastic and was surprised that he didn't he he got a fair bit of critique on demon land um, the other thing the other thing is um, he is genuinely genuinely bringing the ball to ground when he's up there with one hand um, when people talk about bringing the ball to ground it's when you're in a when you're not in a position to market and if he's not in a position to market he is bringing it to ground. And, and the very last goal uh, that we scored started because Bren, Ben Brown bought the bought the ball the ball to ground. That's a bit hard to say, isn't it? Yeah. And, and there were a few <laughs> contests, George, where he 
he was clearly fatigued and gassed and just threw everything he could, he could to get to the contest to bring it to ground. And, you know, that's what the job is really, isn't it? Well, that yep. the reason he's gassed is because he doesn't have a T-Mac who, who would usually play that role of going up to, to, to get the kick out sort of, you know, up to the up the wing and up the half, up to yeah, our halfback I mean, flank to take that. He's sort of doing that and having to get back. As well, so. and, and, and and taking the ruck in the forward and, yes, fifty that, yeah. meters as well when he's not yeah, such a which, strong body. Uh, yeah, uh, Travi fourteen. Uh, a lot of negativity in the media around Melbourne still, especially that that lovely gentleman David King. I don't know why I tune in every week, but as he has done conveniently all year, he draws stats to complement his statements. Uh, like he goes over the past 12 weeks uh, for his stats where he should be just looking at the past three games where we stack up rather well. But of course, he that doesn't suit his narrative. Uh, our inside 50 show we should be in the top few teams, but one forward isn't working. Ben Brown is having to do too much. The reason he goes into contest with one hand is because he has one opponent trying to hold him out of the contest for an interceptor. Uh, he's doing a good job, but he's up against it. Uh, we need another big forward, but who? But we won't get into that, but who yet. Um, I might use, he's talked about a couple of uh, the things, I might use them a bit later. Uh, Red Sox man asks, uh, can you look at uh, at the Carlton and out uh, the, the statistics from the Carlton Melbourne game, and does this indicate that this match's pressure was at a finals lever, uh, level? Most stats were above last year's average. Can we keep this pressure up for the next few matches? B man, did you say you uh, you reckon it was uh, up to finals pressure this game? Oh, totally, it was. Yeah. I mean, it was. I mean, I think their tackling—that's the thing I underestimate. I mean, I knew they were strong in the ball. I thought we'd beat them in the um, clearances at the stoppages, but they were awesome. They were they were fantastic. Cripps was. Um, was fantastic. I thought their battle, it was, I thought, George, that's a perfect way of describing it. It was like an old school suburban footy match, one on one. And they, like, that was, again, when I watched it, the replay, it was only then that I realized how fierce they were. I was seeing through everything through the lens of us being terrible and feeling bad about it. Um, but they, they were fantastic. And, but we, it's important, we got how many more um, contested possessions than them? Um, so we had almost 20 more contested possessions than them. And I reckon that's really important. It shows that the effort's still there. Um, you know, the, the wave running isn't yet. And so that's, that's a, a struggle. But the, to win that game against a team that is as committed as they were on, on, on Saturday night and beat them by nearly 20, 19 contested possessions shows that we're right in the game mentally in terms of that, you know, if that was 20 down, I'd be going, yep, yeah, maybe we're in trouble. Um, but you know, I, I thought that our want was was really terrific in the match. Actually, um, Wells Eleven wants to know: uh, Does struggling to get over the line against the Blues and struggling to put the pies away and doggies mean we aren't really in contention? Last year we felt uh, like clearly the best team in it, albeit with some shock losses along the way. Twenty twenty two has a different flavour. As exciting as Saturday evening was, I have no idea where we generally stand at all. Yeah, again, it sort of goes to that. My, my point about the sort of comparing it to last year, I think that, I mean, some of the the quotes from the round 22 game thread from last year from the Crows I grabbed. So this is from the post-game thread for our win over the Crows, the corresponding game. The game... Um, was by no means pretty. Still a lot to work on. I'm not totally convinced by the form of Sparrow and Jordan. Our back line did look fairly shaky in parts. Still things to work on, and I'm certain we can go up a gear. We were pretty ordinary at times, but I'll give the guys an out after the preparation they've had. Brayshaw in the middle at the end. Great to see he offers us much more than harms there and clearly more than Sparrow. Leave him there. So whoever said that uh, must be happy. Need more outside run. We play likely we did today in the coming weeks will be tough. I reckon today was nearly our worst performance of the year. Need to polish up on our skills and again kicking into the forwards. There were large patches of the first three quarters where we couldn't stop their transition game and we couldn't hold on to the ball either. So that was in a game that people think, thought, look back now with rose-coloured glasses and think, yeah, we played great. We won by seven goals against the Crows, but we didn't. 
it was a scrappy game that uh, you know wasn't particularly um, impressive. I maintain we we played better. We played better since that dogs game in the corresponding games that we did last year. We were fantastic against the Pies. We should have won that game. We weren't as good in this game, and we did win it. <laughs> you know, so um, and we flogged Frio in Frio. And the other th- the other thing is we're we're playing top eight sides now. Yeah. In, in these games, you've got to expect that you you won't have miraculous you know winning margins in these games. We're Fremantle are looking for a top four position. You know, yeah. Carlton Pies are looking for a top oh, four position. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Carlton, Carlton are playing this game in elimination final. Yeah. Mm. Essentially. Exactly right. You know, Bulldogs a couple of weeks ago the same sort of thing. It's not not surprising. Um, the results we're getting and the way the games are being played. These are finals for us already. Yeah, and coming into the, um, you know, Frio dogs are just out the air, but coming into the Frio game, the big knock, even you said it, Andy, the knock on us was we weren't beating top eight sides. Well, we're now beaten two top eight sides in the last three weeks and we should have beaten uh, a third. So it depends what you're, you're looking at. Our numbers are very, very similar to last year, the the extra lot loss notwithstanding. Well, in a week's time, Carlton might not be a top eight team anymore. Just saying. Well, we want Carlton to win. <laughs> we want Carlton to beat the pie, surely, Andy. And I well, reckon they've got a good shot. Yeah. And what does it say for the form ladder when when Collingwood get touched up the way they did up in Sydney? It says I'm worried about playing Sydney in Sydney. If we, <laughs> well, of course, because that's you're looking at like one week at a time in terms of that's what like every game's like a little island by itself. So suddenly they can't score against Sydney and they get smashed. If, what happens if Carlton beat Collingwood next week? Where does that throw people's form idea? Yeah, it's true. All right, uh, t- a couple more. We've got some that came in late on the thread, so I'm, I've gone uh, onto demonland.com to grab these ones. Uh, Doug Rema is actually talking to you. He said, happy man. Uh, James Jordan, before I ask my question, I did a little research. Having uh, James Jordan's having a good year, averaging 21 disposals, 350 average metres gained, 3.4 score involvement. But to me, he looks to be getting tired. Keep in mind, he is still effectively in his second year. Up until about round 18, he was running out games. Since the, since then, these are his stats, which is he's got second half possessions uh, slash total. So in round 19, he's had 16 possessions, but only six second half possessions. Round 20, 20 possessions, but nine second half, which is all right. Round 21, 24 possessions, only nine in the second half. Round 22, 17 possessions, only six in the second half. Uh, Doug Rima goes on to say, he's a good natural footballer, but is he a winger? To me, he takes too long to move the ball, and more often than not, he holds the ball up and kills momentum. My question is, is he better suited uh, to playing off the bench in a midfield rotation? In my opinion, I still think I still think we look better with Gus on the wing. Uh, what do you guys say to that? Well, I reckon he gets unfairly criticised for, uh, in particular, his speed of ball movement. I was watching him actually on the weekend and uh, I was on, again, on the um, member side wing um, and it, it was pretty much one-on-one, George, except he was by himself a lot of the time, way away from the contest. And I think the thing that um, gets missed a bit with Jordan is how disciplined he is. So he like he to play the role he's been asked to do requires a significant amount of discipline to not get sucked into the contest to hold his width as he does so well. Um, and the thing about he gets knocked a little bit before is supposedly um, releasing the ball and going slow with the ball, but. There's no point going fast with the ball unless we've got extra players who have been able to get ahead of the ball. He'll go fast with the ball when we get that wave running going and then there's a benefit to do it. But as as George has made the point often through the season is that Goody's philosophy is built around um, percentages and it's not a low percentage play to kick it forward when there's no one, when we haven't got a better than even chance of winning that ball. If it's a one-on-one contest ahead of the ball, then there's a 50-50 chance we'll lose that and get hurt on turnover. So wait and hold, show the discipline to wait and hold. Um, Exactly like the Carlton player should have done. Instead of thumping it into space because he's had a rush of blood and try to get it forward, hold on to the ball. Um, same with Saad, he could have held onto the ball. So I, I think this clearly is a bit proppy. I mean, I think there's we should be mindful of no one's, while they're playing with, with niggles, no one's injured to the point where they're going to get injured worse. So, you know, they're not putting anyone out there at risk. Um, I think he, he's, 
you know, the thing I would say he lacks a bit of pace maybe for a, a classic winger, but um, he does the job that he pushes deep into defence. He's a he plays that deep defensive role um, that Gus did. Um, so you know, I think that they clearly want Brayshaw in the middle. Um, I, I'd like to see. Um, Gus back to the wing too to an extent, but then maybe um, Jordan playing on that halfback flank. But, you know, he's done the role all season, hasn't he? So, and he's uh, clearly meeting the, you know, the role that Goody's asked him to do. What we've got to do is find a way to um, replicate Gus. Um, that, yeah, you know, we need, him, need him in the back line, we need him in the wing, we need yeah. him in the middle. Um, so, if any Demon Landers have got any um, uh, ideas about how we can do that, send it in. The, the other thing about Jordan is he's smart. He gets in good yeah. positions he, and he uses the ball well. Like nothing looks super pretty, but that even that goal that he kicked last week against Collingwood, that was all because he was in the smart position and he had the discipline to keep his width and, and um, play to the structure. Um, and he doesn't look a polished footballer, like in the sense he's silky smooth, or but he makes good decisions and he doesn't turn the ball over. Um, so, you know, he's, I think, I just love the way he goes about his footy. Speaking of old school footy players, George, or old school <laughs> footy. All right, we've got uh, two final questions from Spirit of Norm Smith before we move on to Casey, the ins and outs, and um, our opposition watch, and our special segment of the run home. Um, uh, so, two questions. Uh, one question: One, uh, what's uh, the tactic of kicking to the forward pockets rather than the central hotspot in front of goal? It's such a negative defensive play and easily stopped. Perhaps explains why we have fifty to sixty inside fifties, yet goal scoring rate of eighteen to twenty percent. We've discussed this before on the show. B man, you want to give you a quick thing of why we go to the pocket instead of going to the hot spot? Uh, there's actually a really, really good thread on this that talks, and Willow Ratings is, is again involved in that, is that the numbers are clear, is that uh, you turn it over less um, and you um, get scored against less by doing it. Um, it's the smart percentage play. Um, the idea that it's predictable, you know, it was predictable last year, wasn't it? Wasn't it predictable coming into the finals last year that we would do it and we continued to do it? And all of these teams who had a full season of footy to work out what we're doing still couldn't counter it. Um, it's it's predictable to us. Um, but the main reason is it's percentage play because you turn it over. If you turn it over, you're turning it over 70 metres from your goal. If you turn it over with a short kick to the pocket, um, like if you watch when Brisbane play, um, Cozzy will be look, going like a mad hound to try and get across to Rich who will be given the ball in the pocket to make that next kick dangerous and we'll get turnovers 50 metres from goal, um, not 70 or 80 metres from goal. Um, I might get you to do a TED talk to the people who sit around me at the at the G because they <laughs> they can't believe we just keep going into the pocket. Um, so with the uh, spirit of Norm Smith's um, second question probably has the same answer. So he says ninety percent of the time Stephen May kicks out to the sixty to sixty meters out to the pack on the half back flank. So predictable. The question why it's very boring and other sides push numbers and punch it back. How do other sides vary it? Like the Swans who bought to, bought to the ball, uh, I think he said, bought the ball to their inside fifty on five out of eight occasions without a magpie touching it. I think I answered that question in my previous. Yeah, well, that's I'm sure <laughs> that's it has the same fine. answer. It's the per- <laughs> percent, percentage play. Predictable is this. It's the percentages, and it's the reason I'm saying the numbers is because there was a really interesting. Um, point about the analysis of, of that and why you do it and drilling down on the numbers and actually doing a statistical analysis. And that's when stats are useful because they're using them to determine something. And in that thread, I pointed out that in basketball had a similar change to um, from a statistical perspective when they recognised that when they did the math that you get more um, points uh, cumulatively going for three-point shots, even though you get much higher percentage of two-point shots. So the game basketball changed from the 90s when it was all 80s and 90s when it was all about getting it, feeding it inside to your big centres who who get easy layups under the basket to now, you know, it's a three-point shooter thon That was all done on analytics and th- that was what this thread was discussing, the analytics of of things like that, of kicking to that point. All right, let's move on. Thank you to all the um, listeners who provided questions. I'll give you a shout-out at the end of the show. Um, 
Casey, uh, they won a Grim and Dower Festival of Scrappy Football in terrible conditions over the Blues by 16 points despite having more than double the scoring shots of their opponents. James Harms was the standout with 35 disposals. And next week in the final round of the season, Casey take on the second place Lions and a win will see them remain undefeated for the season, five games clear, obviously on top of the ladder. We have a question from Lefty. Um, who says, I didn't watch Casey this week, uh, but see that Joel Smith kicked a goal. I had heard that he was training with a forward, so I take it that he played forward. Do you guys think he is a smoky to get a game this season as another forward option? Uh, George, uh, you want to take that and then uh, speak about Casey's game? I'll, I'll answer the second question first. I've got no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he has been training get... as a forward and playing as yeah, a forward. Yeah, he, he has been playing as a forward, and, and in this game he... he um, uh, played as a forward as well. Um, they did move him up the ground a little bit um, in the second half, but uh, surprisingly to me, um, they had a forward line in the first quarter, I think it was in particular, where they had Mitch Brown, Wiedemann, uh, Van Royen and Smith all playing in the same forward line. And I thought, well, this this is teaching us absolutely nothing because I don't know who's who's going to mark the ball or who's <laughs> leading or wh- what's going on. They, they seem to move them up the ground a little bit uh, later in the in the game, uh, this is only Smith's second second game back from injury, um, and the conditions at Casey were just awful. Um, it was it was a lovely day in the rest of Melbourne, but down there it was it was wind. <laughs> the Waverley it was, factor. It, it was awful, absolutely awful down there. Um, there was one goal scored by uh, in in the first quarter by both teams in the first quarter, um, so it just became a. Um, a, a real slog of a game. Um, the um, interesting thing about um, uh, Smith was I, I was seeing a lot of uh, he, he played well, he competes well, and then he does something very Joel Smith like. You know, he'll suddenly hand pass the ball to the wrong player in co- completely the ro- um, wrong situation. Um, so. Which is one of the reasons I like him as a forward because you know, yeah, it's it doesn't not, hurt it's you. Not going to kill you way. as much, no. yeah. Um, so a lot, like I said, I, I saw a lot of that, but it was, it was just a game the way you couldn't take anything really away from. Chandler and Bedford were not playing because of apparently because of COVID uh, protocols. Um, Van Royen uh, wasn't able to get his hands on anything for the whole game. Uh, Wiedemann was Wiedemann in the first half, and then miraculously in the second half seemed to have some sort of injection or whatever it was, but he was playing pretty steady on uh, <laughs> um, an epiphany. Maybe yeah. yeah. Um, took some really good marks and then probably kicked the ball to the opposition. Um, but yeah, it was, it was certainly a big improvement from what we've seen from Wiedemann before. Um, they had Jake Spencer playing. Um, and I think Jake Spencer can go back to, to, to um, uh, Doncaster or wherever <laughs> he was playing. He, he was, he was like a statue. He, He's nine foot tall and he just keeps hitting the ball to the wrong place or to his feet, which doesn't suit anybody. Um, and I think that was why they brought Van Royen into the ruck in about the last 15 minutes of the game or something. Um, they were only playing Spencer off the bench uh, to replace Bell um, in any case. Um, so, yeah, Wheat finished up with 23 disposals on, him on, a, on a pretty crappy day out there. Um, which was good. You, 20, that's, that's good numbers. Yeah, 20, 23 disposals. So it, was, it was quite, you know, considering that it, what others weren't doing because it was such a bad day, he, he did pretty well for, for what he was doing. The real concern is that I don't think there will be anybody who played in this game. Uh, Harms had 35 possessions and Dunstan racked up a whole swag of possessions as well. But these guys played on Sunday. So if they're going to play in Brisbane, they're off a five-game, five-day break and having played a game in really appalling conditions. so It's I, good I, for resilience. <laughs> it's good, it certainly is, yeah. And, and the most resilient were the spectators who were out there yeah. um, watching this. There were a, fair, were, were a reasonable contingent. So, yeah, I don't know what the, what we can take away from this game. Um, uh, Casey had a bye last week, so people like Chandler haven't played for three weeks. Mm. Um, um, you know, what do you do? Ha- Harms was great kept on trying to do far too many things, like kept trying to break through tackles and uh, didn't quite realise that Carlton were also playing AFL-listed players and you don't do that. Um, but, yeah, 35 touches, that's great, fantastic. Um, 
uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him back as a Medi sub, maybe maybe into the side, but it, it'll be a big ask after that game. Well, the whole club uh, is going up to, to Brisbane because we're obviously playing Brisbane Friday night and then on the Saturday the, the twos are playing Brisbane. So everyone's going up, including, I heard today, uh, Tom McDonald, who will be doing uh, continuing his uh, rehab training and they're mm. saying he's two to three weeks. It, who knows, it might be earlier that might uh, bring him back for the first week of finals if they're... You're telling us there's a chance, Andy? Uh, there's always a chance. <laughs> it, so it that, could be do or die, that final, so why not? Uh, on Smith or it's really... I mean, I've got a, a few things wrong this year, but I've got a, a couple of things right, one of which was Melksham. So I'll put, I'll, you know, I've been, I tipped that Melksham might come back in and I've been pretty pleased with Jakey Boy saying I was one of his critics and I gave him... Uh, some big ups during the season and he you know we, we shouldn't let the podcast go past without actually crediting him for that win he was well fantastic. i did i did talk about um, him in my match yeah. wrap up so yeah, yeah that's true but yes yeah, we, yeah, we should acknowledge true, him i think walking yeah, you should acknowledge him again uh he was awesome um his mark um in that last quarter um it was a poor defensive effort i think it was maybe Darcy or uh, one of the commentators made a really good point is that that was the standard McGovern thing to do is sandwich have, him. Yeah. 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 Someone should have McGovern been behind him for him to be able to have space to move back into. Um, was spewing. He missed that one round the body after he took that mark diving mm. backwards. That was um, a fantastic bit of play. Um, I heard him interviewed after the game on, he's a funny cat. He was asked how he, how he's feeling. And he said, I'm feeling powerful, very powerful. <laughs> and he said it in a way, he wasn't joking. It was like, <laughs> In fact, even backed over it. He said, "I, I doesn't hope that doesn't sound whatever, but I do feel powerful." <laughs> I was like, "Okay, I want to have a bit of that feeling too." But yeah, he he was awesome. But I, I'm finding it one of the things that I've been wrong about is that I was positive that they'd bring in a second tour. And I, as I keep saying, they're playing like they've got a second tour. It's like Melksham has been brilliant and he was brilliant in this game. And the other thing is his job was not to kick goals. Of course, that's brilliant. His job was to shop weed, uh, stop weedering and he did a fantastic job with that. Um, he was he, he wore him like a glove. It was a really impressive. I don't know how many um, intercepts weedering got, but it wouldn't have been more than two or three, I wouldn't have thought. Um, but I, I was been positive that they're bringing uh, going to bring in a second tour and the way they're playing suggests to me that they still will. So I reckon Smith, getting back to Lefty's question, uh, I reckon Smith is a chance to come in, but surely two games of VFL is not enough. And um, you know, um, maybe they're hoping T Mac will get back. But uh, I thought there was a really interesting non-comment, if you like, by Goody in the presser. He was asked about Melksham in the presser, um, and he talked about our lack of a second tall. And it was sort of didn't wouldn't have really loved that if I was weed <laughs> because we have got a second tall. It's just that he's not in the frame. But maybe it's a reverse psychology thing by Goody and. Uh, weed's still in the frame, I don't know. But it seems to me we need a second tall um, or we need to modify our game plan. And it doesn't seem like he's keen on modifying his game plan. It's still kicking to the pocket, as as Norm um, was saying before. So, well, I'll just go, while we're still at Casey, I'll just go what uh, back to Travi14, who uh, made some comments uh, about some of the players. He said, JVR looked okay on the weekend, especially considering the conditions he was also not too bad in the ruck, presents well in attacks, contests hard. Only issue is young guy coming off a five-day break after playing on a heavy track might be a bit hard on him. This was him talking about whether we need another big forward, but who? Uh, Smith, uh, he's, in a, he's in a unique proposition. I have a feeling he might be a good option, which is big for me because I'm not usually a Smith fan. I think he could be the aerial contest person we need to free up Brown and Fritter. He ran out the game well on the weekend and played okay. Uh, without being outstanding. Only issue is he has a tendency to go for marks that others have better position. Uh, Weed, very good game, presented well in the wet, uh, linked well and ran out the game well. We've been here before, though. Do we do it again? Um, I think we have to play one of these three, but who and who comes out? Yeah, I, I agree with all yep. of that. And, uh, you know, and I, I do think Smith is a smoky because he's – Goody loves him. That's the other thing. Is Goody has gone to the Smith well a couple of times, and and but for an injury, a late injury um, for Smith last year, he was every chance of being a Premiership player last year, Smithy. Yeah. So um, I reckon it's the sort of you know Goody. Goody is criticised for being boring, or um, but he's not. You know, he he's not. Um, 
it's not completely out of the um, his way of doing things to bring someone like Smith in as a surprise to the opposition. So, um, you know, I, I think it's definitely... The other thing about that, you just mentioned Fritter then, is that he had a terribly mm. quiet game, yep. and but he had no space. It's like George was saying about the way the game was played. There was no space for him to run into, and that's the other problem with not having a second tall, is that you don't get... He doesn't get the chop out. He doesn't get the second... Um, he the gets third. maybe the second best defender, yeah. um, as opposed to the third best defender, and he gets he doesn't get that space to run into. He's he's expected to, but he I think he had seven mm-hmm. tackles, Fritter, mm-hmm. um, which is awesome for for him because that was a bit of a knock on his game this time last year. Um, ins and outs. I'm not sure whether we keep this segment on the show as it seems we only ever make changes when someone's injured. I highly doubt we'll make any changes to the forward line <laughs> we structure. We got it right once. <laughs> <laughs> and the only other change I can see occurring is perhaps harms coming in, but we've mentioned, uh, well, we have a, a, a listener's question. Uh, Pew 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 says, uh, Harms had 35 possessions with Casey on the weekend and he's been used, uh, he's been the unused sub for the past two weeks. Can you see him getting a call up this week? And if so, who makes way from him? And as we mentioned, it's coming off a five day break. So I don't know. Not sure whether he comes I have, in. I'm agnostic. Uh, I have no opinion on Harms this week whatsoever. <laughs> no, you're not going to make a, a bet. Uh, no. you know, It'll be two no. circuits of the MCG. <laughs> no. Double or nothing. What's what's uh, double? No. If he if he um, doesn't play, I promise not to run around the MCG. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I, we don't know. But unless yeah. George has uh, an opinion, well, the only the only one I've got a question over is Charlie Spargo. Um, we have uh, a question about he had, Spargo. He had four possessions and. Total meters gained was was uh, twenty eight, so it's barely one kick, which uh, raises an interesting question, George. Because and, uh, yeah, I, look, I, I'm I'm a big fan of Charlie Spargo's, but you, you know they've been using him on the wing as a rotation for Jordan. Um, he does obviously doesn't fill that role all that well with that sort of output, um, and I would have thought you know Harms provides probably similar sort of uh, probably at least what Charlie has been providing in, in certainly in this last game and maybe in the game before as well. So he's the only one I'd have a question over. Sorry to interrupt there, George. The question that it threw up in my mind is, let's say hypothetically Smith does come back in, whether it's this week or for the finals. It's, it seems to me it's more likely for the finals because he's only played the two games off for quite a solid break and he probably needs to get a bit more game time. But they brought in Petty after the one week, so who knows that... Um, um, but if he was to come in, you'd have to think that Melksham's keep keeping his spot. Like he's doing, yep. you know, yep. he's kicking goals. He's won us that match. He he's not four, going two, out after four, six goals. four goals. He's not going out mm-hmm. this week. He's probably not going out for the finals. So if, uh, he's in uh, deservedly. So um, who comes out then? And for me, the only two players that I could think would, would might come out if Melksham stayed and Smith came in was Spargo. Um, because he's a forward, it would have to be forward for a forward or Sparrow, because Sparrow is plays a high half forward role, but he chop gives Viney the chop out mm. um, role. But with Brayshaw but playing as a midfield, that's probably less a, uh, a need now as it was when Brayshaw was at half back or wing. So it's a really interesting one. One of those two young fellas might be in the frame for getting dropped if they do bring a Smith or if T Mac um, is ready and comes back in. Uh, Doug Rema had added that he might. He had said, in my opinion, uh, Spargo isn't providing enough regular pressure. Doesn't play deep enough to hit the scoreboard or be front and centre enough. I'm sick of watching A and B stand at centre forward every week. If the club has hopes of T Mac coming back, we must play a second key forward. Uh, Goodwin won't play Weed or JVR. Is Joel Smith worth a look? He has five tackles, six marks, and nine possessions in the slot for Casey. Uh, also, Sparm out for Harms, Spargo out for Joel Smith. So, I think the so thing about Smith that, that I really yeah. like as a forward in that role is that he plays tall anyway. He's got a fantastic leap. He's got a defensive ability to cover ground, to get across and to get across the contest and impact them aerially. Uh, and he's actually a really neat kick for goal. He's got a very simple kicking action. 
Um, you know, I really like him as that chaos sort of type forward. In fact, when he was down as a defender, that's sort of the position I was, um, you know, hoping he would play as, as sort of that chaos forward. He's got, you know, he, he's got leap on him that is probably second only to Jackson at the club in terms of ability to, you know, to um, jump up vertically. So, you know, also an ex-basketball player, doesn't quite have the same time as Pendlebury, but, um, you know, a very high-level basketball player. And, and he runs as well, so and he runs. That's he, right. He'll relieve the pressure of having to move Ben or Ben Brown having to run up to the wing and do the yeah, work. Yeah, that's and right. Smith can move up as well. And it's not just important to give that chop out that running T Mac does is it drags his defender up the ground, up and down, up and down, then helps gas the defender, which, uh, as you say, Smith would do the same thing. But we're, we, we haven't been right on this up to this stage uh, no. about bringing a second forward in. But uh, no. yeah. and, and doesn't Smith no. have form against Brisbane? Didn't he kick four goals as a forward against Brisbane in a practice match? Uh, even <laughs> while the injured. Much, the most hyped <laughs> practice game of all time. Yeah, <laughs> yes. That was the one where he stayed on injured, didn't he? Yes. That's right, one yeah, yeah. And, and, then, and, and then the Demon Landers have never forgiven our, <laughs> <laughs> given our coach. Our coach no. yeah. um, Just before we go on to the next bit, Andy, just, yep. to, uh, just in case we didn't, I know you talked about Hunt, um, yes. but I thought he was brilliant. And, I, and you know, it's interesting, isn't it? There's been some commentary that I've read that I, I, it's hard not to argue with. There's two of the most influential players in the last, or at least this week and, and perhaps less so last week, were two players who, the only two players who weren't in our premiership team this uh, last year, this week, in Hunt and Melksham, both were instrumental in this victory. I thought Hunt's um, run off the halfback flank was fantastic and, George, you'd be really happy with his much improved ability to hit targets and weight the ball properly. He, um, really, lo- hard, he so. really looked down at his kicks every time you saw. He sort of looked mm. at his hand and his leg and yeah, yeah. measured it. And just a, just, a, just a thought too, Andy, is you said that he kicked to the top of the square. And, in fact, um, Jimmy Bartell this morning on the on RSN made the really good point that, no, he didn't. He kicked well north Forward. of the top of yes, the square yes, so yes. that they couldn't hit it through for yeah. a point. Yes, no. Um, so he was praising how clever that whole setup was from Lever knowing to go inboard or, and, and, and instructing players to be in there. And then the, the release to Hunt and the fact that Hunt didn't go all the way to the top of the square, that he went 20 metres out from the top of the square or 10 metres out so that there was no way that um, the um, Blues could knock that over for a rush behind. Um, all right, let's move on to opposition watts. Uh, according to stats I read a couple of weeks ago, the Lions were one of the worst defensive teams in the competition and but conversely, they are also the leading the league in the point, amount of points scored. If the Saints didn't have the yips this week in front of goals, they may have well upset the Lions. Uh, if some of the Lions' past performances are anything to go by, I don't think we will experience the same amount of pressure we have received from our opposition in the past few weeks. Having said that, the Lions are a different beast in front of their home crowd at the Gabba. And if the Ds want a top four spot, they need to win this blockbuster Friday night uh, clash. Um, John Demonic has some questions about tactics and matchups. Um, he says, an inform Rainer as their bullocking forward mid adds Zach Bailey and Zorko that weren't in their round 15 uh, clash against us. What, if anything, will we do differently to that game? Uh, what will our matchups be for all of their dangerous small forwards and goal kicking mids? Uh, who wants to take that one? <laughs> one of the first things that we'll have over the in this game, they might well have Bailey back and Zorko, but we also will have Gorn and Jackson back. That's uh, true. For a start, but we did pretty <laughs> um, well without them, <laughs> if I recall. Well, yes. <laughs> Yeah, we did. Yeah. So, look, that's that's just the way that football yeah. goes, ins and outs. Um, I watched the St Kilda game. There is absolutely no doubt St Kilda should have won that game by five oh, goals. Tell me about absolutely. it. Absolutely. Still crying. Yep. Yeah. Um, the, the the missed set shots from 20 metres out. Oh, front, King. Good. Uh, were, he could were, get a game in ours. Uh, he could get <laughs> a game without <laughs> King. It was, it was, it was just slot right into our forward line. It was just awful. I, I counted five. Um, it should yeah. have been gimmies, gimmies Total absolute gimmies. gimmies. Um, I think what what was interesting was how loose Brisbane are, and it's not surprising that uh, they get so much scored against them. Um, they depend on scoring a lot uh, from the likes of, um, you know, particularly Cameron up forward. Um, they've got a number of players who who rotate through there. 
what was interesting was um, McInerney the previous week was absolutely unbeatable and then Marshall took him apart this week and I think the same thing will happen again uh, when he has to come up against Gorn and, and, and Jackson. Uh, they they play a, a high possession game. Um, they've got uh, they depend on individual players a lot um, that they won't get the opportunity with this game. Uh, Daniel Rich was let let free by St Kilda in, in the game. He was able to run out to the 50 metres before he kicked it a further 50 metres on numerous occasions. You've just got to put someone on him, uh, Ben Man said before, because he will be right on to him to, to limit his um, uh, exposure in the game. Charlie Cameron's the one that we've really got to work on. Um, we shut him down pretty well completely the last game. I think he but had the job uh, the last time we played, but uh, he was let he was let loose in, in this game and kept him in in the game. Uh, Danaher keeps flopping around like um, I've seen some DM in Landis describing as one of those blow up. Uh, things that you see outside a tyre shop. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, the flappy with, arm. With fl- um, flappy things, arms yeah. And, and, yeah, and, and eventually <laughs> flopping on the ground. So he, he continues to do the same sort of thing. Um, yeah, look, the Saints should have won that game quite easily. I, I, I just wasn't – I'm not concerned with what Brisbane can bring to the game that we can. Um, we've got a lot on the line for us this week. Um so massive, I, massive game. Yeah, I mean, I, I reckon that question about that it, it's less Cameron. I mean, Cameron's a star, um, but we'll put a lot of time into him, and you know, there'll be a strategy to work out. I, I the knock on his game is that he's defensively not brilliant. Yeah. I don't reckon and he doesn't get up the ground. But um, Rayner and Bailey are the two that worry me, uh, and also the other ones. McCart is it McCarthy? Lincoln McCarthy. Lincoln McCarthy. Yeah. Lincoln McCarthy. Yeah. Well, they're the the size players that we struggle with. Like you know, and then you're chucking Cameron. Um, you know, and and Rayner. I've got a lot of time for Rayner. I like the way he goes about his footy. He's a good half forward. He's strong. Um, it, it's going to be a big test because you've got Hibbard's going to take. You know. Uh, maybe he takes a Rainer or, or he'll probably get Charlie Cameron, I guess. Yeah. Um, Lever is going to have to take um, someone like a Lincoln McCarthy or um, and Bailey, you know, it's just that small defender that, you know, we've talked about that we lack. I mean, our system, you know, will protect as best we can against us and we push down and we'll win the grand ball get. I mean, I'll be fascinated to see this game because, as I said, if we're on and if it is... You know, we are trending the way we we um, need to be in terms of the loading stuff. Then, you know, we'll see that in the last 15 minutes. That's when we'll see um, how far we are on that path. And, um, you know, I, I, it's a, such a huge game, isn't it? Because we, like, it, it's the first game of the round and it sets up a whole lot of series of dominoes after that because if we happen to, you know, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but let's say we win by four goals. That means that Saints um, Sydney game is suddenly yeah. um, comes percentage comes into play. We're point six percent behind second, uh, and that's massive because if we win um, and um, jump ahead, we could we play um, Sydney potentially at the MCG first week. It goes the other way, and we play uh, if we win uh, and they and we don't pass them on percentage, then the opposite happens. So it's massive, and also for Brisbane. The irony about this for Brisbane is that last year they snuck into the top four because um, f- um, the Dogs completely ballsed up against um, um, Port in that last game and dropped out of the top five. Um, the reverse could happen this week and they could drop down to six. As I'm cutting your lunch a bit there, Andy, I know. But, um, um, <laughs> but yeah, a huge, huge game. And, and the club will keep talking about this. They love travelling. Melksham said that exact thing in the post uh, interview I was talking about before. He said, oh, we boys love to travel. Um, going up to Brisbane, they really frame that in a positive way. So it's another huge game of footy for the club, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, Stu says, uh, looking ahead to, uh, to Friday's game, if we get up by four goals midway through the last quarter, as you as you was mentioning, uh, B-Man, does Goody keep up the intensity to take second spot or do we revert to norm and shut up shop happy with securing a top four spot? Well, I don't – we attack, don't we? Because, I mean, it's huge. Yeah. And so, you know – um, as I said before, it's got so many parallels to the Geelong game last year. Um, well, it, it, it will be all whether we've got the fuel in the tank. If we haven't got the fuel in the tank, well, we won't be able to attack and we'll, we'll park the bus and we'll chip it around and we'll play tempo. That's just 
just the other thought. That's what Carlton did really well against us. I thought they never allowed us to control the tempo. They controlled it with that one-on-one stuff that George was talking about. It that's it didn't feel like their game. It didn't feel like our our game either. So I thought Voss coached really well. But you'd hope we would just go for it, won't we? If we could get a chance to put percentage on and put pressure on Sydney and you know, hopefully St Kilda do the job. I'm just looking at uh, what the weather situation is. Uh, it's Friday perfect. night, 26 degrees during the day on Friday. Uh, it's all sunny, so 23 the next day. So, I mean, the low overnight is 9 degrees, but uh, oh, I don't know. It doesn't perfect. get dewy there later at well, night. Well, 9 is a, yeah. nine's all right. Um, all right, let's um, let's talk about the run home. Uh, there are still a number of scenarios that can impact where we end up after round 23 going into finals and just importantly uh, who we play and where. Uh, a win will guarantee us a top four finish and the double chance. Uh, if we win and the Swans win, then we need to beat the Lions by about, I, I think it's about two two goals or something, two, three goals to make sure, uh, more than the Swans beat the Saints uh, for us to finish above them. Um, so in the event that both of us and the Swans, both us and the Swans win, it'll be percentage that decides which venue we play them at. So if we both win, we're playing them and then it all depends on uh, if we win by a certain amount, then we get to play at the G, otherwise we're playing at Sid- in Sydney. I don't think I need to ask either of you which venue you would prefer to play on uh, in this case, do I? Uh, you, I'm, gather, I'm gathering you want to play at the G. Is that correct? Well, only so I can go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but all right, <laughs> take the going out of it. Well, Where do you want to play? There's a case to be made that <laughs> that they, their record at the um, SCG has not been as good as it often is and, they, you know, what they, they're – They've got an advantage. The Swans is their, you know, um, speed across the ground. They're a quick, pretty quick team. So they're a team that likes to spread. Um, and um, but yeah, of course, we'd prefer to play at the G. It's our home ground. So. That's right. After, especially after last year when we didn't get to see any finals, yeah. and the first yeah. opportunity this year we get is going to be denied <laughs> to us again. Yeah. So having to, I, mean, I what, what I was more getting at is that I'd be still relatively confident playing. I'd be very confident us playing them up there because our contest game is, um, you know, it, it suits the the confines of the MC, uh, the SCG. Um, uh, so then, um, uh, then we play, then if we win, uh, and the Swans lose, uh, and I think that's un- quite unlikely, and that Collingwood win, then we play the Pies at the G. So it's a bit of a rematch of that game a couple of weeks ago. If in that scenario, the Pies also lose, uh, and then Frio win, which I believe they should as well. Then we play Frio at the G, another rematch of a, a disappointing loss um, last season. Um, so if in that scenario, D's win, Swans lose, Pies lose and Frio lose, uh, then we end up playing the Swans at the G anyway. So these are the scenarios that can occur with us winning. Uh, if we win this week, we either play Swans in Sydney, Swans at the G, Collingwood at the G, or Frio at the G. That's if we win, they're the only opponents and venues uh, that we'll play at. Um, now, if we lose to Brisbane, there's a lot more things that can happen. Um, and uh, the results of the, if we lo- if lose to Brisbane and the results of the Swans, Pies, and Frio go the expected route, uh, then, which is them all winning, um, then we play the Tigers at the G in a do or die final. Um, how do you like that prospect, guys? Uh, playing the Tigers at the G with uh, their rabid fans. Well, I'm not going to worry about it because uh, we won't won't be happening. Oh, well, so we'll just, I'll, uh, I'll worry about it. this week, and then I'm um, <laughs> going to start thinking about my ticket for the qualifying final at the MCG. Um, other scenarios uh, with us losing include, and I won't go into into detail to all the permutations, but I'll go into the poten- into the potential opponents. I'll preface this with the with the Bulldogs beating Hawthorne. I think we can all agree that that is most likely going to happen. I think Hawthorne will put the cue in the rack. Uh, in uh, so the Bulldogs beating Hawthorne in all scenarios, and not more than uh, one unlikely result going our way. For example, Swans pies, Frios, or losing or two losing 
and one winning. I, I won't go into all those scenarios. Um, we just won't have that luck where that will happen. However, if we lose and they all lose as well, then we will finish fourth and play the Cats at the G's. But that's a scenario that ain't going to happen. I, I don't care uh, which unit, which universe, which multiverse you come from. Uh, if Frio lose and the others all win, then we play uh, the Bulldogs at the G. If Collingwood lose, uh, are the one to lose, we play Carlton at the G. If Sydney lose, uh, we play Richmond at the G, unless the Swans get pumped by more than us, in which case we'll play the Bulldogs. So if we lose, it's possibly the Tigers, Bulldogs, Carlton, or if we are the lucky losers, uh, we still get a double chance and play Geelong, or if in the same scenario the Swans also get pumped, we could end up playing two weeks in a row at the Gabba. So there you go. Uh, Andy, like I've just had a bit of a technical issue. Can you go back over that again? <laughs> <laughs> what I was basically saying is we're most likely going to play the Tigers, Bulldogs or Carlton if we lose. Um, that's the, they're, they're the most likely of the, of, of the scenarios. Um, but uh, I reckon if we... in the guts, not finishing top four, wouldn't it? Like it's yep. going to be, it's going to be in the guts. And... Uh, you, I think you should get prepared for that case. So we're not, <laughs> I, I don't think we're a certainty to win. Um, we're playing well, the Of course Lions we're not a certainty the, to win. At the Gabba. Um, it's all in our hands, Andy. It is all it's in our hands. Totally, yeah. um, totally in our hands. So yeah. Not sure so, how comfortable I am with playing the Tigers. Um, I, I posted on Demon Land today. The thing about pessimists, they've got an advantage over optimists, is they're more often right than <laughs> um, optimists. So, um, but the good thing about being an optimist um, is that I'm going into this game full of confidence, so expecting to win. Um, and uh, I think we will. I think um, we will win. I think that. I think, in all honesty, in all seriousness, the club has deserved a bit of faith. Um, Goody deserves a bit of faith. The planning and preparation, um, they, you know, they would have looked at the end of the season. We've won two out of our last three games, three three um, top eight contenders who were all pretty primed right to go now. Um, we match up super well against Brisbane, um, have done for the last two, three years. Our system is kryptonite to their um, forward line. They don't have a defensive system um, that is strong, which, you know, if, if we're up and about, we'll really look to exploit. Um, if we're not, they'll, they'll obviously do much better against us because just we won't be generating the same number of forward lines. But keep in mind that first half of the Pies game, that's what people's North Star should be looking towards this game. If we replicate that energy, and I suspect we will, um, then, you know, and win this game like I'm hoping that we will, um, we'll roll into the finals with the energy that we did last year uh, and will be incredibly hard to stop from that point on. The benefit uh, also that you optimists get is that you have a glass that's half full. <laughs> um, Viper Crunch that's asks, <laughs> if we lose on Friday and don't finish top four, can we still win the premiership? I know, B-Man, you're going to say yes. George, what do you say? <laughs> of, of course we can. It's been um, – people forget where in, – even in – you know, the, the past isn't a guarantee of the future, but people forget where the Bulldogs were, where Richmond were um, when they went into their premiership winning finals years. They, they weren't at the top. Um, so um, when you're in there and you've, and, uh, you've got a chance, you've always got a chance. So, um, but the probability it. goes significantly down. Yeah, so I reckon that, you know, from an odds perspective, the, the current price – I think, you know, I've talked about this a lot, but the, the thing about punting and about the pool is it's up into the many, many, many millions of dollars now and that serious dollars are, so it's not emotion-driven um, punting that drives a price. Geelong are 275 favourite. We are clear second favourites at four. And going back to that, um, the um, premiership metrics that Wheelow Ratings put out, we're the top two teams on those metrics, Geelong and um, um, uh, us, which the thing that jumped out when I, as I said, I hadn't fully um, read it, but when I scanned it was that that's the sort of metrics the pros look at um, and it's the top two on the table. The top three is Sydney is third. So they've got that right there, the top three in um, betting. So, um, you know, if we happen just from a probability, if we don't finish top four, it probably realistically goes out to sixes or sevens. But just because you don't have the double chance and it's just statistically much harder um, to do, um, but of course there's still a chance. 
All right. Um, uh, George, you wanted to have a quick mention about the AFLW. They, um, of course, the um, the women played uh, in the Curtain Razor to the uh, men's game the other night. Uh, Dee's coming out massive uh, victors. What was it? 70 points, 60 something points? Yeah. Yeah, seventy odd points. Yep. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. The girls start start their season in uh, eleven days' time, I think, when they play Adelaide over at Norwood, Norwood Oval. But uh, yeah, this was a great uh, hit out for the girls. Um, Daisy wasn't playing. Uh, Taylor Harris went off at half time with uh, some sort of leg injury or something, but I think it was only minor. So don't get too upset about that. She seemed to be doing exercises with the physio um, during the half time interval um, quite freely. Um, but it was just a practice game at the end of it. Uh, for, when when you looked at the opposition, Carl, Carlton were a, a, a seriously good side last year, not top of the ladder, but seriously good. They've got some great players. And we absolutely, utterly smashed them, absolutely took them apart, um, which was you know, quite remarkable. We've got um, some really strong girls in the midfield now, Liv Purcell and um, Eliza West, um, just kept on getting the ball in particular. Um, so it, um, it was just just really good to see. We've got a lot of tall, tall girls in the side that I think are the result of um, uh, some really smart recruiting from a couple of years ago when people could see where the um, new teams were going to be admitted and that we took our chances to draft um, upcoming girls at that stage, you had some height it, height to them. So, yeah, w- we've got a really lot of lot of really tall girls in the side. It's quite quite uh, telling. And then we've got some really tough inside mids. You know, uh, as as happened late last season, Karen Paxman, who was sort of held the um, midfield role for the first five years of the women's competition, is playing on the wing at the moment because she's being pushed out by these um, other girls in the middle. So uh, it's pretty nice when. If if the ball goes out and the the opposition run into a Karen Paxman on the wing, um, they, they soon know, know what they're up against. So um, yeah, really 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 good opening. Um, so let's see how we go against Adelaide uh, uh, in a, in about uh, eleven days' time. Am I right in thinking McNamara has done an? Was it McNamara's done an? Yeah, yeah she she had an injury uh, in the weights room. Uh, damaged her back, I think, was, was the problem. I, I'm not exactly what the sh- sure it was, but yeah, she's just out for the season. Out for the season. That's that's terrible news, isn't it? Yeah. Just hate that for you know any sort any player, and she's such good energy as well. Like it's not yeah. just the way she plays. I just love how, the energy she brings. Just quickly on the AFLW, the AFL would be wrapped. I mean, it's a big call bringing in the extra teams in this season, and it's going to impact on the quality. So you know, get used to people knocking women's footy for you know, the quality for a little bit. But, um, you know, the rationale of it so clear is that I, I saw today that they've had to move um, the first game, Adelaide, uh, sorry, um, Essendon Hawthorne, Hawthorne to Marvel Stadium because the stadium where it was going to be held across the road was sold out. So, you know, that's that's what this is all about, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was fantastic that they played that practice match before Melbourne Carlton. I think it's a, a good way yeah. to get exposure and I think they should do that because the AFLW is going to be starting sort of to coincide with um, uh, with the with the men's the end of the men's season, at least these practice matches they should try and get them uh, in front of um, in front of some some men's uh, men's games so that uh, yeah. gets a bit more extra exposure especially and as we talked about last season or last women's seasons that I think it's really important they play these games not at bloody Casey and play them in stadiums that are protected from the wind and you know if they're interested in the product and having a product that you know the the the, the absolute fools jump into women's footy on social media then put it in in the best possible environments on the best possible surfaces where wind is not an issue I mean it's a real problem I reckon Kate, um, the women having to play down at Casey. Not not knocking Casey's ground. The no, whole thing but it's just set up. But yeah. it's yeah. All right. Well, I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you to Nairobi Demon. Thank you to D Zephyr, El Diablo, D Old Fart, Kong Wacker, Kelpian, Radelay, Travi 14, Red Sox Man, At the Break of Gorn, Wells 11, Lefty, Pew Pew Pew, 
John Demonic, uh, Stu and v- Viper Crunch, Doug Reamer and Spirit of Norm Smith. Um, if you want to uh, send in a question to us, you can do it a number of ways. Jump on the thread that we start at the beginning of the uh, the week, uh, the podcast thread on demonland.com or you can always ask us a question through uh, the messenger on either t- uh, Facebook or Twitter. Um, if you follow us on either of those platforms or Instagram, uh, you can uh, PM us there and submit a question question that we'll do or you can give us a call during the week on 0390163666 that's 0390163666 and uh, yeah you can leave a message on there don't worry no one answers the phone um, yeah thank you uh, to my co-host George and B-Man and thank you to you our listeners uh, we'll be back next week hopefully to discuss a win for the ages and we'll also preview the finals go Dees Red Leggers. Come on.